you ever felt like you were living a narrative that someone else wrote for you? Maybe your story was written by your family, your church, or your culture. You may be asking yourself, what is my story? And how does it uniquely fit into the story of the gospel? At the Allender Center, we believe that your story reveals God's wild goodness in a way that no other story can. We've helped thousands of people understand and live their unique stories, and we'd like to invite you to start engaging your story with the free guided exercise available for download at theallendercenter.org slash story. Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. This is such a great day. I'm so grateful. We're going to introduce our guest, Andy Kolber. Now, Andy is, from my standpoint, a brilliant, compelling, beautiful writer. And, uh, you know, the, the first book was so disruptive. Um, and, and that was a book called Try Softer, which obviously is the playground of being able to reverse this ridiculous phrase of try harder. But to follow it up with a book called Strong Like Water, Finding Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things. So what I, what I would, and again, ask you, Andy, to respond to this, but you're a bit of what I would call a, a, a stunning and graceful iconoclast. Mm. Um, you, 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 you name bullshit within the believing community, uh, and you do so in a way that bears n- no cynicism, nor sarcasm, mm. nor just yeah. uh, disrespect, but you're also, uh, at least for my reading of you, a, a woman who's like, no, <laughs> no, no, this is, this is not going to be. So, Andy, so grateful mm. uh, for you to join us today. And just love to know, is that uh, the notion of being iconoclastic? Is that a fair reading of you? Wow, that feels... Um... That feels like a big term to live into, but I think I feel, I feel honored by that. I think it is the journey of my own maturity, um, to live into my values. Um, you know, I think Mm -hmm. part of, you know, one of the things I talk about in my books is that I'm a survivor of complex trauma from my childhood. And, and part of, I think what that has meant for me is sometimes having a deep knowing, but not having the internal resources always to live into it. Mm -hmm. And so part of my own journey, and I think my writing, I I hope, I pray that the trajectory of my writing is is about that, right? Like to live into this, these values actually has required me to get softer um, so I could get stronger. Like that has been my journey. Um, and so I, so I think, yes, I think I do, I do appreciate and resonate with that term. Um, though with a little bit of maybe a, to use a biblical idea, like fear and trembling, you know, because I don't think that's mm. something that's not something that I'm like, you know what I'm going to be. <laughs> I mean, maybe on some days, but, um, yeah, I, so all that to say, I think it has been a journey to live into, um, the values that I think I hold really true. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, it, it's uh, a, a bit of a, a contradiction is not true. It's antinomy closer, but uh, maybe just the play of paradox uh, that you have found a way to enter and begin to disrupt. And yet the disruption is not for the sake of creating more 
disintegration, but actually much mm. more peace. So, you know, a peaceable iconoclast mm. is such a very different presence. But I, I just found myself many times reading uh, a paragraph or longer, a page or more, and just literally having to go, oh, take a walk. Mm. Mm, take a walk. Uh, because things were stirring. And I think that's where, as you invite us to your own and others' engagement with trauma, that, you know, your sophistication and understanding the uh, uh, sort of the interpersonal neurobiology of trauma, understanding of the interplay of the effects of trauma. We can go through all that, but I think I'd rather ask, like, how did you get here? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to say, one, like, I feel um, such a deep sense of almost paradoxically peace when I hear you name that it feels disruptive. To, that this concept um and and i think and i feel that piece simultaneously because it's never a, it's not um to disrupt for disruption's sake right yeah. it's it's like a, a phrase and I, I i borrow this language from deb dana um because i think i've heard her say it first but um is this idea like in service of wholeness Right. That, um, you know, for many folks who've, who've had to live from a place of a trauma response or many trauma responses, um, that's been in service of survival. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, I think part of healing is that shift as we can begin to um, win who we are, when our sort of North Star can change to say, um, this doesn't have to be simply just to survive anymore, though that is valid. Um, but it can be for something even bigger, um, that deeper integration, that wholeness. And so um, that's one thing I just wanted to name. That's something I was thinking about as you were talking. And um, But yeah, this question, how did I get here? Um, wow, it's, it's, been quite, it's been a heck of a journey. It's been a heck of a journey. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, there's a lot of layers. I think, you know, I think in big strokes, what I would say is I survived my childhood by um, basically learning to look really good in quotes on the outside, like, like to, um, to do the right thing, to achieve, um, to make people happy, um, to often tie myself into knots to give more, um, in, you know, than I had to give. And so on the outside, um, not a lot of people were concerned about me. Like I was the kid who, um, it was like, Andy's going to be fine. <laughs> Andy's going to figure this out. Andy's, you know, I was, a um, I was a, a basketball player. I, I did really well. I, um, went on to play college basketball, um, was always in leadership positions, got excellent grades, was never in trouble. I mean, was doing all these things, right? So outwardly, it makes sense that people wouldn't be worried. The thing that was so hard is that I was so constantly living from a place where I felt like I was about to break. Um, and it was like, I developed strategies to, um, in those places sort of succeed in the way that was needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I was alone, I mean, I was, I, I mean, very, I think I was probably very dissociated, um, lots of anxiety, lots of disconnection, right? And so I share that because it's a confusing presentation. <laughs> it's not the thing that people typically say, oh, here's, you know, here's something we need to, like, this person needs more support. Um, and so it wasn't until I really graduated from college, from undergrad, and some things began to, um, I had always been, you know, basketball played a really big role for me um, in sort of um, lots of things, but there was a lot of achievement that happened there. And so multiple things happened at once where life sort of disintegrated. And my family became more and more 
um, it was it was chaotic and traumatic the whole time, but it became more and more destabilized um, as I got a little bit older. And it was like every it, things hit a fever pitch. And so it really mm. wasn't until I began to um, do my like get into graduate school, do some of my own work that I even began to it's not that I would have said my family was healthy. I, I wouldn't have. But I didn't think I had any claim to lay on the word trauma. I thought I had no right to talk about that. I was so convinced um, that I was strong and that I was strong, uh, that, I, that I didn't deserve um, the care that maybe someone who had been through something that I would have seen as more significant. Um, so all that to say, gosh, I was 20. Four, 23, before I even had an, a glimpse of that. And that put that did set me though, um, thank God, on a trajectory, right? And I think as my body could handle the information, I began to put the pieces together. I think if I would have understood the depth of it right away, I don't think I could have handled it. I am... I am now 40 years old. It has taken me whew, a long time to really see the, like the fullness of the harm, the fullness. And part of that is because some of the harm continued into my adulthood um, with a parent who was deeply abusive, um, even after um, having to set really firm boundaries um, so all that to say, I think part of it for me was getting into some spaces where my body began to feel safe enough to see the truth. Mm -hmm. And that, that began that journey. And just because we really don't know one another, just to say that's a very overlapping story to yours, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, I mean, I've, I've thought this as I've encountered your work and just been so grateful. Um, you and I could sit in a coffee shop and have long mm -hmm. conversations and probably not actually have to say very many words to be able to go, huh, um, just very similar. Obviously it's your story, your particularities, but just very similar trajectory of, you know, going to grad school at 24 I'm 41. Um, I appreciate how you let your, I mean, in a way that I think you do it with such honor and integrity, like let your body actually be a living sacrifice in mm. the costly labor you do it for yourself, but on behalf of others. And um, so, mm. yeah, I just, I, I, your tears, um, there's just a holy pause um, to them. And just even knowing my own journey, um, the hours, the labor, the resourcing, the like shifting, like the transformation that feels so much worse before it feels better. And, yeah. and then I think especially what I appreciate about how you write and how you do this interweaving is your acknowledgement of the body, because in mm -hmm. some ways, mm -hmm there can be such tremendous healing of the psyche and even the spirit. And it feels like the body is such a key part of that. But it also, to me, at least feels like at times, like the last frontier of where the dysfunction, you know, there still has to be such a tender tending to um, what it is to have survived complex trauma and for all the systems, not just, the neurological ones, but all the systems they're connected to. And so I just say mercy to you. And also thank you. Like, thank you for, mm -hmm. um, yeah, letting your body and heart and mind be a living sacrifice unto mm -hmm. goodness. And I hope mm -hmm. in a way that like restores life to you. And I know it brings a lot of restoration to others. Um, because I, that high functioning survivor, um, mm -hmm. and I think, especially in this season where we see so much um, being exposed and unveiled, like with things like shiny, happy people and, and other, you know, until the truth, which is coming out sometime this year. And we're seeing 
especially women who are coming out of high religious contexts, that story of like the good person who's high achieving, high functioning, but internally is suffering so severely, Mm -hmm. but can like externally to some extent, keep it together. And for me, it was my senior year of college where it was like, it just all came (laughs) like colliding out in that way that I couldn't keep it internal anymore. And, And at that time, I still did not have a language for trauma or psychology, even really coming out of the Southern Baptist context I was in. And it was like going to grad school to be helpful to like help people (laughs) (laughs) because I'm a healer Um, Mm. and being like, Oh my God. (laughs) Oh my God. There's so much here. And so deeply grateful for the trajectory um, and know that. And I appreciate the way you write with such a humanity and a vulnerability that Mm -hmm. it will be a lifelong Mm. journey of healing. Um, And a part of me goes, Oh, thank God. Mm. And a part of me goes, Oh, I'm tired. Some days I'm tired. Yeah. Yeah. The two of you have that element of having been really good human beings. Um, and Andy, the way you put it is it, it's almost like what suffering you knew was not comparable to mm. others who had more of uh, an overt capital T. Uh, abusive context. Um, and so uh, of the three of us on, on our conversation, um, I would be more the prodigal. And sometimes mm. prodigals create their own trauma mm. and also suffer something of the more egregious forms of um, violence. But the older brother or sister um, often doesn't look they look good. They obey. They're righteous. They do well. They're highly competent, etc. So what have you, and I would say both of you, what, what have you had to engage mm. in order for the reality of your own complex trauma to actually come to the surface? Well, obviously, one word was you began to disintegrate. But I know a lot of people who disintegrate who don't come to the ownership that you have named. So just to invite you, how, you know, as you hear the notion of being an older brother, sister, and having to face trauma, where does that take you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I, it brings up a lot of different thoughts for me around my my journey. And I think part of it, even in the last five years, I would say, because a lot of the trauma that I think I experienced um, was psychological. Um, one of my parents was, a, I believe, a malignant narcissist. Mm-hmm. And in that context, um, I actually did experience some big T trauma but I think my v- view was so distorted about what I had experienced that I didn't think I had permission mm-hmm. um, to to even like. So I just say that to say even I think even from writing, you know, so I wrote Trace After really in like 20, 2017 to 2019, even in that time, as I have unpacked, because there has been parts of my childhood that I just didn't remember. There's a lot of parts of my childhood that I I didn't, I don't have a lot of memories of, which is why I am, as a side note, part of why the body is so important to me, because the body always holds the story, even when we don't have the full narrative, you know? And so that's been so sacred to me to know that my body still knows my body was still witnessing. And so part of it for me, it's definitely been, you know, I sometimes talk about with complex trauma, the healing needs to match the complexity of the harm. Right. And so for me, it's, I've needed many different things. That's why I sometimes joke. My books are like hurting cats. (laughs) <laughs> because I'm like, well, we're going to need self-compassion and interpersonal neurobiology and mindfulness. And, you know, I mean, there's just because to me, I'm like, there are so many great resources. And in order to have the ability to match 
what's happened. We are going to need more than just one thing. We are going to need many things to, to sort of weave it back together. Um, and so, you know, I have done, um, I think body, body work, body centered work has been absolutely vital for me, understanding things like polyvagal theory and really practicing it, not just knowing it, but, but experiencing in my body, this is what settledness feels like. And here's what it's like to build my capacity to be with goodness. Um, and then I think one, another concept that's been so vital is really doing parts work, you know, whether that's through like IFS perspective or just also, you know, whether that's been an EMDR, um, really connecting to the different parts of me who've experienced the harm because, <laughs> like the older brother concept that has been important, but that is one protector. That is one protector. And I'm grateful to that protector. Um, that protector has softened a lot. That protector mm -hmm. has learned to say, you know, I had to be that at times in my life. Um, paradoxically, I'm the fourth of five children, but I do very much have, um, it, you know, we sort of talk about in my family, I have oldest child tendencies by being very over responsible, tending to, you know, like, I'm like, you need a leader, I'll step up, I'll be a leader, you know. Um, but so, so I think there's been all these different elements of things like reparenting, um, developing self-compassion, right? Like a voice, an internal voice um, that can be a place where I can rest, where I, um, you know, I talk about it like participating with the spirit of God in my own healing. Like, yes, God can heal us and I am invited. We are invited to participate in our own healing. And that's so important to me. Right. Because I think that oftentimes in, in some faith contexts, it feels like um, that is not OK or it's shamed to want to participate or want to actively co-create and work in that space. And and I think really unlearning some of those things and knowing that God's heart for me and I think for all of us is to, to move towards wholeness. Mm. And, and that is, and that's one of the ways that we do that. And so, you know, I think of it, um, a lot like a dance and different seasons. Like I'm like, okay, here I'm doing more parts work, but here maybe I like, I'm really working with my body, really listening to just truly like, um, one of my favorite things that I've learned in sort of somatic work, um, is being able to, like really connect with parts of my body through the language of like, if, if that tension in your chest could talk, what, what would it say? What does it want to, what does it want to let you know today? You know, and just really lovingly coming alongside those parts of myself. And so um, it's definitely been, um, I think there has been as much complexity to the healing as there has been, um, to the complexity of the, of the trauma. Mm. I just am like, yes, yes. What she said, <laughs> that's what I feel. I just, I'm so grateful for the ways in which you weave language together in such a clear way in the midst mm -hmm. of so much complexity, because, you know, in a, I am the oldest child. Um, and, um, in the season that I disintegrated, it was such a it was such a clear breakdown. Like, I mean, I really got to the point where I was like, I'm insane. Like I am legitimately insane. You know, I was having OCD. I was having severe panic anxiety, which had been true my whole life, but it was like, I couldn't rein it in or like just work harder to get through it. And so for me, I think I just, it's almost like Dan, if I'm thinking about that biblical story of the prodigal and the older brother, it was almost like I actually had to be like, I'm just going to be the prodigal. Like I'm just going in deep because I don't know what else to, like I genuinely am so far beyond myself, which was so terrifying because so much of my, of the kind of decisions I had made is like, you need to be able to provide for yourself everything you need. And if you can't, 
man, who knows what's going to happen. So to be so far past my edges, it was like, I had to ask for help. And I had no idea what help I needed initially. And that has been such a stunning, beautiful, complex journey to just, I mean, not that I actively was like, I'm going to take my inheritance and run. It was more like, if God wants me to feel this way, I don't want to have anything to do with God. Like if I can't pursue medical help through like a therapist or mental health or like medicine, then like, fine, that's fine. I will take my inheritance and get Hmm. out of here because I can't live like this anymore. But I think to also find space for those really complex parts of me that have experienced a lot of healing and I'm still discovering like parts I didn't even know, like as the journey goes on. And um, yeah. And I think for me, story work as another piece of that, I mean, body work has saved my life. Um, I, my gut is so different today than it was 10 years ago through a lot of tending and a really good doctor who's an advocate and like takes the whole mm. body and whole person seriously. And, um, and I think story work actually helped me locate in some ways how the different parts came, came to be. And, and in some ways, like what developmental place are they most connected to? Um, and, and that has been all kinds of different work because in some ways, different parts of us that kind of, came to be as a way to survive need different things and to like tend to that like your language of reparenting to tend to that um with patience and with nuance and actually getting to know those things um i mean there's so much more somatic work i i long to be doing and i'm that's kind of i'm one year postpartum so that's it's it's also new <laughs> new kinds of somatic work needed. Um, but I just, yeah, the complex, I, I just so grateful for how you're talking about complexity. And Dan, I would say for you, even though maybe you would say you started as the prodigal and definitely bear more in some ways, the scapegoat, if we're talking about like the good child versus like the scapegoat, I know you too can relate to the complex nature of healing and being a participant in it. <laughs> yeah. I do, but I've never been good uh, in the way that the two of you have, and I mean, legitimately suffered profoundly in that kind of compulsion, um, that the complexity of your worlds, um, and Hunty, to, to name that, a kind of flagrant and cruel narcissism um, that, (laughs) generally speaking, is brilliant at being able to Mm -hmm. dissipate the violence of their harm into a, a your fault, you're to blame. And so, you know, when you internalize, you're at fault. And you need to be better so that the compulsion to be better really is a trauma response Mm -hmm. to what your body is suffering in that cruelty. It's a different kind of trauma process because someone like me needs to come home, but the two of you needed to leave. Uh, mm, thank you for saying not, that. Yeah. That, that doesn't look the same at all. Even if you're coming truly home, you got to come home by leaving. And that's a very, I think, a much more complex process Ooh, yeah. to engage than somebody who's just created chaos and harm in the process of having been harmed. So that's what I'm trying to get at. That. Mm. It, the the two of you have had, and I think others like you, who have been good, and I mean good, not just fake good, good. That, um, in some sense, it just it makes me both furious and heartbroken that that complexity is added to the complexity mm. of the kind of world, Andy, that you rose uh, in the middle of. Mm. Well, that thank you so much for saying that. I think it 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 brings up emotion to hear that because i think it's mm. so often misunderstood 
the burden. I mean, here's what I'll say. Anyone who's experienced trauma is carrying a burden. Right. Anyone who's experienced that chaos and those things, like that is a burden. I often talk, talk about like trauma has a cost always, always. And I think what you're naming, which I feel so honored by that in my body, I feel honored of a sense of like that sometimes the way back out, the unwinding of the trauma, that's where it gets more complex, right? Yes. And I think there are certain types of trauma where the unwinding is a little more clear. And I think with the type of, and I, I don't want to speak too much for you, Rachel, but it sounds like um, when the unwinding involves so like having to be so wise and discerning with like, um, is this person even sorry? Or is this person going to continue harming? Or is this dynamic actually, um, if I stay there, will it make me sick? Right. You know, um, when we have to take those types of things into account, the burden is so high. And I know for me, this is the other thing I was thinking about as we're talking about this, uh, sort of this dynamic of the older brother and the young and the younger, right, that has left the prodigal. Um, ironically, in my story, I feel like the way out, the way to healing was actually through the prodigal right? Because I needed to leave. And part of that was to say, no more. No more. Like, I can't. I, I will not allow you. Like, the, I will not participate in my own harm. I, I cannot allow that, right? It's not. And I think this is a very misunderstood dynamic because um, the grief, <laughs> the absolute grief involved with having to make a choice like that right? Mm -hmm. To grieve um, someone who is alive um, because to stay into contact with them would cause you so much harm. And, and I think, so that's an interesting um, paradox, right? That there's this idea that it's, it's actually by becoming and actually embodying the no, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm taking some liberties here, but there's a sense of embodying a no that happens with the prodigal by saying, I can't stay here anymore. It's not safe. And that has been, you know, when I think about my trajectory of healing, and even as we, as we, where we started our conversation today is talking about this idea of, you know, I, I, I think how you describe me like a dis disruptor, like these different things. And, and, uh, you know, you, if you would have said that to me 18 years ago, that would have freaked me out. <laughs> That would have scared me in a very deep panicked way because the feeling in my body would have been, well, when is the shoe going to drop then? Mm -hmm. And when is the punishment coming? And when, when is the thing, when is the, the cost going to have to be paid for that in a very specific way? And so part of the journey and why all the tools have been needed is to be with the parts of myself who were there and present during the worst punishments, the worst harm. And to say, now I like, I'm with you. I am an adult woman. That's right. We are resourced. Things are different now. Things are different now. Yeah. I just wanted to say, Dan, that I think, cause I would speak to maybe like a slight difference in our story is I, I, my context is more so much of the harm, I think came in really unwitting ways um, mm -hmm. due to trauma and the way that wasn't dealt with or even acknowledged or known immaturity. Um, and so in some ways I, my leaving, which had to happen has allowed growth to come when I've been able to integrate back in, in ways where the adult me that's resourced is kind of like, and I'm collecting all my parts. Mm -hmm. You come behind me and that discernment and wisdom to know what the boundaries need to be. Um, which I think in some ways intense, like intensifies the complexity even more because obviously nothing is linear and you know, nothing gets to be clear cut. So it's a dance. And there are times I do that well. And there are times I do not. 
Um, Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that's just what comes to mind and thinking about the road to healing. Yeah. Well, there's so much here. And again, we don't have the pleasure of infinite time yet. As I think about the reading of your work, what, what I would say is, again, I love that image of you're moving in multiple directions with a certain simultaneity. Uh, And yet there's this deep, 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 um, lovely bringing things back home. So (laughs) it's not a fair question and hardly any (laughs) are, but how do you do that? And, And especially how do you honor and have you always honored your tears? Mm, mm. Yeah. How do I do that? You know, I think to me, really the the first thing first has always been um, having to be able to find some places where I could receive, um, receive some safety, receive some care. Um, I think that has helped me build an internal safe base. Um, and, and in the times when that internal base feels shaky, it's almost like going back to, right. The places where I can be cared for, where I can be seen, um, where, um, it's not about what I achieve or, uh, you know, any of the things, the hustle, the, any of those things, but like the essence of who I am is honored. Like, um, Mm -hmm. those, that safety, that very, that to me is where I always go back to, right? Like those things that are, they feel so basic, but it's always the basic things that really build us. Because if we try to go to step five, when we're on step one, we won't be able to move forward. Um, Such humility. Yes. Yeah. So I go to step one a lot. <laughs> like I really do. Again, this is why I love body work because to me, the body is just, we can get a little bit more clear, right? Like, I feel like it's, it's like, let's, there's all these other things and that's valid and important. And as I am able, I can get there. I can, I can build up to those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting outside, um, basic, you know, things like I do. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with grounding, but I do so much grounding and orienting and bringing myself to the present allowing myself to really partake in things that make me feel comforted. Yeah. Make it help me to feel good, you know? So uh, your tears, lovely, lovely, compelling. Has there always been a friendship with your tears? You know, I think that I used to probably feel some shame with that. I've always been a deep feeler. I'm high, I'm highly sensitive, but, um, I was, I used to be a lot better at suppressing my emotion. I mean, I used to be pretty good at it, I think. Mm. Um, and the more integrated I am, the more, when I talk about my story, the tears are there and I still feel, I mean, not every time, it's like, and I feel pretty online, you know, neurobiologically when I talk, but it's like, it is just a, um, it is like, it's like saying like, I see you Mm -hmm. to myself. Mm -hmm. It's like a way of saying to all my parts, yes, I'm speaking on behalf of our story. And this is worthy of honor, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the tears for me, I've grown a lot in my own self-compassion. Um, because I think sometimes, you know, I think it's really normal for people who have felt shamed for their emotion when they feel emotion to feel shame. And so I think that especially in the last, I would say like seven to eight years, my own ability to just witness that in myself and just to like acknowledge like, yes, like that brings up some emotion for me and that's okay. I had a conversation earlier today with a, a lovely friend, and as he was speaking, tears came, and I could see uh, just this 
desire, uh, movement physically to brush, uh, you know, the idea of letting tears linger. Um, not that they should fall off your chin, but nonetheless, could they? Mm. And you know, it, it, we came back just in conversation to this passage of Psalm 56, and mm. starting with verse 8, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my mm. tears in a bottle, and they are recorded, each one in a book. And that notion of recording is not just uh, tears on uh, September 23rd, blah, blah, blah. It's they're named. Mm. Um, it's one of the few places where you, you have the reality that he names the stars. And this is a very strong implication as well. He names each and every tear. So every tear, you know, I mean, I don't want to be ridiculous, but, you know, that tear is George and <laughs> that tear is Stephanie and et cetera. And, and in its recording, there is a sense in which the, the tear collector mm -hmm. holds our suffering you know, and Rachel, you've talked about this many times with regard to Romans 8, that the Spirit prays for us in language we can't comprehend. But that whole notion then of it, it, your sorrow, Auntie, is it's really big. Mm. And somehow it's been held certainly by the living God. But you have somehow come to hold your own suffering in a way that feels like it's likely so much more honoring, mm. um, so much more carefully bottled, like um, a compelling uh, perfume, but also that your tears have names. Mm. Um, is that, does all that mm. strike you as... Yeah, I think it's beautiful. And to me, I think it, it really touches into, I mean, certainly part of my story is at times faith being weaponized against me as a trauma survivor for all the ways that I couldn't pray or just muscle or white knuckle my way out of complex trauma, you know? And so that's certainly been, it has not, it has not always been a, this clear resource. I've had to fight, I would say, for my mm -hmm. faith. But I've also said, would say that God has fought for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a beautiful picture of God's heart for us. And, you know, I think this idea, Psalm 23 has been a really precious psalm to me. Mm -hmm. um, and just the language mm -hmm. of God tending to us, you know, that the way, the nearness, the particularities of God caring for us as even though, even though we have to go through the valley of the mm -hmm. shadow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think it's really powerful um, to know, I, I do feel that, that God has always helped me, that the true thing is that that has always been God's heart. I have not always been able to see that. I not always experienced that, um, but I believe that to be true. And I think you know, a lot of the heart, especially, I mean, both of the, my books, but especially Trisofter, that one of the premises is that in the same way that God is deeply compassionate to us, we are invited to steward that profound compassion to ourselves, right? It's like, it's like, that's the river that does not run dry. And it's like, if I can get some of that compassion, like if I can just, if I can steer that in my direction and, and help, um, sort of deliver that like a cool drink of water to the parts of myself who are so parched, who are so dry, who are so exhausted. And to say here, you get to drink too. Right. And to me, like that's healing. That's what it looks like to participate in healing. Hmm. Oh my, I really wish we had much more time because what I also want to eventually ask, maybe we would be humble enough 
to receive the gift of your presence again. Mm. But the the question of so water is so strong, but it's also obviously life giving. Mm. But it's also freaking terrifying. <laughs> It is. It is. It's, it's, it's the, it's the paradox, right? And I love the fullness of the metaphor that there's all these things, right? And that like the thing, the goodness of God is that we can both survive, like we can adapt and survive, right? Like water adapts to survive, whether that be ice to vapor to liquid, right? But also that there is something um, deeply life-giving, like we can't even exist, right? Without it, and um, I, I am forever drawn to water and the metaphors of water and the ways that Jesus is the living water, right? And how mm -hmm. deeply this speaks to something in us that is so essential mm -hmm. to our humanity. And I, um, yeah, I mean, I think as I continue in my own journey, I continue to. I don't know, just get a little bit of delight from seeing how these things that have been true for all time, like who hasn't known that water is essential, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I get delight, you know, out of seeing how that continues to be true. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Bruce Lee's um, Be Water. I don't know if you're familiar with the book that his daughter actually wrote of this, but just I mean, obviously a little bit of a different philosophical stance, but just that sense of like, be water, my friend. And yeah, yeah. I love Lao Tzu. Um, he, you know, probably similar uh, yes. philosophical. Um, he, he has a, you know, a, a quote that says, um, what is soft is strong. Mm -hmm. And that for me, it was the bridge a little bit between try softer and strong like water mm -hmm. and how those mm -hmm. things um, beautifully, paradoxically, mm -hmm. actually fit together. Mm -hmm. Well, there is, uh, again, another way to come back to this uh, description. Uh, there is such a life-giving, open presence in someone who knows paradox and in one sense, not just wields it, but submits to the playful paradox mm. of what you have written. So I, I do hope that our listeners um, have a sense of what a remarkable and lovely, and yet um, with great cost and with great tears uh, of what it has taken for you to come back to yourself, mm. to leave, mm. but to come back. Mm. But as well in that, what it invites for us all uh, is something again of the promise of that deep, 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 deep conviction. There is a place for healing. And I, I feel like you have done that so exceedingly well that I want our audience to partake of that water. So thank you. Thank you. For joining us yeah thank you so much thank you thank you both for what you've shared it's really an honor to hold this space with you the allender center podcast is produced by the seattle school of theology and psychology if you'd like more information about the allender center you can look at the allendercenter.org mm -hmm.